Welcome to another episode of the All Systems Go podcast. We, you, you all know the drill. Um, we invite startup founders and digital marketers to discuss strategies and software used to build automated marketing and sales systems for scale. I'm your host, Chris L. Davis, founder of Automation Bridge, and I have the privilege to have Daniel Cooper with us today, and he is the founder of lolly.co and it, he's on a mission to transform repetitive business processes into slick systems by watch this combining process consulting and superior software development if you're like whoa that's a lot that's big trust me he'll break it all down <laughs> for you in this episode but he started out as a video game developer and found his way into serial entrepreneurship. And his aim today is to automate 1 million companies. Daniel, welcome to the podcast, man. How are you doing? I am great. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. The privilege is all mine. Sure. Yes, yes. So so you know the second you, you said process, <laughs> you had me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I want to there. There's a part of me that just wants to jump right into it. But I understand I want to be fair to the audience. Give us a little bit about your background and how you made it to where you are. You've got this process. Uh, you, you've got software now. You're process driven. But you started as a video game developer. Like how yeah. did what? <laughs> How did know, we get right? here, man? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? I ended up here because I'm a terrible employee. Like, I'm the worst. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, poking holes and everything. But uh, the way I got here was uh, I um, I love to code since I was a kid. So mm. if you ask my father, I like to break his computers. I didn't quite see it the same way, but, you know, we'll agree to disagree. And um, after years of studying i ended up working for um sony playstation developing games there which was which was great and wow. i think i got the itch really wanted to start my own businesses and one thing led to another and a few businesses along the road you know some good ones some some bad ones i ended up in a situation where i was cto uh, a, a medical clinic mm. in central london and um i was i was brought on there to sort out all of their internal processes and, and to bring in technology because it was just it had been the same way then i think since really like almost like 1998 nothing had changed I'm yeah now, now, now let yeah, me like ask you this, this thing. yeah let on. me ask you this daniel when you were as when you were a software developer or game developer for sony is that where you started to see like as you were writing the code and developing you started to kind of lean more towards processes maybe some object oriented passing variables is was that the exposure and then when you went into this role you kind of leveraged some of that thinking i think sony being a, a japanese company it was incredibly organized mm. um you know so i i'm unsure and unaware if other game development companies are all the same in the, in the way that they develop their games but i highly doubt it. Uh, it, yeah. it was like a military operation it was so well organized everyone had their tickets it was down to an absolute t and i think that that was a really great example of a highly organized company that was able to produce these games on mass because of course they'd use other game development companies who would make games primarily for playstation or, or microsoft or whoever um but of course they'd make their own games in-house and that's where and that's where i was uh, but that's really where i started to see the process but for me i think the biggest part of processes was in my own businesses where things just became painful mm. right where you just get sick of doing some stuff like, man i'm sick of doing this one thing over and over again and i that's where really the the process orientated side of it started to come through but i believe that the consultative aspect came once i was inside the the um the medical clinic primarily because you know you had to kind of put your case forward right to all of the shareholders yep and that was the and that was the challenge there, right? That's where you have to kind of come in from a more consultative point of view. Yeah. I love it. I, I know one thing that that I'm realizing, and and these are this is this is just life, right? Like how it how it happens. But you you do a thing for so many times and you start to realize the where the value is. 
right? So I I, I take like an athlete, a, a, a basketball star will uh, or athlete will dribble, they'll run, they'll shoot, they'll pass, they'll do all of these things, right? But it's not until they figure out that one thing that they're doing that's actually impacting the team. So it's like, you know, what? I can do all of the things that athlete does. But when I play defense, we win. Right. Mm-hmm. When I shoot the three, we end up winning. I need to do that more. And I feel I can just see so many parallels in every profession. So it's like here you do all of these things. Hey, I can build a business, build a website. I can do some automation, this, this and that. But then you start to see when I put structure where there is none, businesses grow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like when I introduce structure, when they bring me in and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Can you make sense of it? And maybe they don't say it in those words, but essentially everything around you is like, whoo, this is <laughs> this is going to take quite a bit. And you start yeah. to add the structure and you're like, that's really what's moving the needle. Yeah, right. But like no one's there is no team in the NBA that, that does not have a coach. Just yes, it, it, you can't be at that level and not have the coach, right? It's equivalent, but basically of not having a plan. How many businesses yeah. do we all know? And we're all guilty of this in some aspect, to some level in different areas of the business where there isn't yeah. a plan where you just haven't had the time. But it is the equivalent though of every single player. No one's playing defense. Everyone's just trying to shoot constantly. Right. And it, it's, it's not going to work. Um, and, and that's where being organized and having systems and strategies is, is really, really important. And there's an odd glass ceiling in all businesses, whether we'll hit that, we will normally around $2 million in revenue and they just can't work out why they can't break through. And the next one is at like five and then beyond that, like 15, but yep. it's really common at that point because the, yeah. the, and the thing is the game changes, right? The high school team compared to the NBA team, that's a different game. <laughs> Yeah, it requires a different level of stamina, different level of organization, different level of performance. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up because it is something that I've realized and it's relative to the company, but there just are certain plateaus that you just are going to hit and and experience and you're going to have to do something different. I I think the best quote I heard is what got you here won't take you there. Yeah. So it's like, (laughs) look, that disorganized, chaotic way of running your business may have gotten you here, but it's not going to take you to the next level. And sometimes people tap out and they say, I'm, I'm fine with a, a million or two. I'll just keep running it this way. Um, so I guess it's their prerogative to run their business how they want to. But give us give us a little insight on where did Lolly what? First off, tell us about your company, Lolly.co, um, and what drove you to create the software? So the company was formed almost purely at, out of accident, really. Um, mm. I was working for the, for the healthcare company and uh, a contact of mine had said to another contact of his, you need to speak to Daniel about um, automation systems within our company. We are a big finance company and they came in to speak to me. And I gave him all the advice and the guy said, oh, I don't want to do it. I want you to do it. I said, look, I haven't got the time. Like I've got a job here. I'm good. And he said, look, name your price. So I just said something stupid. And he said, sure. Okay, cool. So when can we get started? On- <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Fine. Well, okay. I'm going to have to start trying to work my way around all this now. Um, and that's, and that's really how it started, but it, the, the company that we have really, there's two core focuses on what we do. The first thing that we do is we're looking at processes and we're looking at systems. We're looking at how the business physically is running. Uh, mm-hmm. and then the second part of the company is actually building custom automation for our clients to then power those processes that we've redefined and optimized. The important part part of all of this is that it is a it is terrible advice. If someone comes to you and says, I just want to automate this, you go, cool, let's just build it. That is a bad idea because the process might be wrong in the first place, or it might be that the ROI is terrible. For instance, if you came to me and said, Hey, Dan, uh, I want to automate uh, our blog writing. Can you please build us some automation so that some machine learning writes some blogs for us. Sure, but I'm 100% certain that that's going to cost way more than just hiring a professional writer, right? Yes. And that's the thing. Yeah. The ROI is terrible. Why are you doing it? And for us, it's about working with our clients to try and establish that the processes they are trying to automate are actually meant for machines. 
and not and humans are doing things that humans are meant to do, right? Mm. You don't ring your bank, or you might do, but I've never heard of anyone ringing their bank saying, "Hey, just put me through to a robot." Or right. I'd love to have someone I can speak to in my bank. Boy, that'd make a big difference, right? And I don't care if they automate the rest. Yeah, and they should. But that, no, that's, that's what we that's, do. Man, that's a really good point. That what 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 is that? You know, like. How do you help somebody understand, hey, that action you're doing is actually better suited for a robot to do? Like sure, for right? technology <laughs> to do, you're actually doing a job out uh, of Do you know what it is? Norm. I think a lot of it is, uh, it is really making people assured and feeling comfortable that we are not there to take their job from them. We're yeah. not there to replace them. And we involve staff at all levels in order to make sure we're working with them. They are the ones who help us establish what the processes should be and help them understand how things can improve. Otherwise, you're going to end up with like the old scene of pitchforks and flaming torches outside the business owner's door the next day, right? Where we've replaced yeah. everyone with like Skynet. But that's that's not the plan. It, it is about, I don't believe that there will be businesses that are completely automated in the future. I just, it can't happen. Yeah. You know, right. in, in, what, in what you do with the great automation and marketing, is you're helping salespeople and marketing people leverage opportunity. So yes. where you're able to line up, you know, all of these marketing touch points, whether or not that's email or SMS or whatever it might be, for then a human then to take control. Because we're terrible at following up on stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The you consistency know, like, factor. And we remember stuff terribly. Like humans, our brains are useless. You'll be in the shower and you'll be like, ah shoot, I was going to email that prospect and I forgot, yep. right? Yep. And then you walk out of the bath and then you've forgotten, it's gone, right? But machines don't forget like that because it's not the way it works. So yeah. I think that that's the really important um, like divide between all of these things that both you and I talk about of automation, right? In that we are empowering people to be better at their jobs and to do the, the, the more fun stuff, right? Not the hammering out of emails or whatever it might be, but actually getting to talk to other humans. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I want to so I want to spend um, the, the rest of the of the podcast. You, you know, we know about your 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 upbringing into, uh, you know, how you matriculated to where you are and how you started the the, the company that you own now and, and the purpose behind it with equipping businesses to really get a hold of their processes. Um, there, there's two things that jump out to me. Um, that I that I that I would love to just give you the floor in. Uh, the first is process mapping. Uh, I, I told I shared this internally to to my team. Um, I've been using this term for a while, and to see someone else use it appropriately, it just made me smile. I was like, "There's someone else that understands the <laughs> power and importance of process mapping." But I know that this is a new idea to a lot of people. Longtime listeners of the podcast have probably heard me mention it in some variety. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is give you the floor and just walk us through what is process, what is process mapping and what does it look like when you go through it? Like what, sure. what are the steps? You know, yeah, yeah. so I think you have to uh, look at the business from like, let's look at the business from different um, heights. So if we look at it from a 10,000 foot view, we see it as X person does X thing and it results in X goal, right? That's the 10,000 foot view. The 100 foot view is what we call a standard operating procedure. And this is like a meticulously written step by step in a manual. Someone walks in, bang, you put it on their desk. Like here is the exact plan, like the exact play, like step for step, minute for minute. Yeah. Between those two is the flow chart for process mapping. and. The idea of this is we're really now looking at a thousand foot view and what needs to happen here. And this is really quite important is that if you look at any kind of business that starts to grow, you start to establish multiple people in roles. And if you are not careful, if you do not have a view like this, uh, like a process mapping view, you get what we call normalization deviance. So that means that let's go back to the basketball analogy one player one day there's no coach so one player turns up one day wearing like sandals and someone else goes well he i might wear like i don't know boots tomorrow and then someone else was and before you know it, it's become normal and like you've got a whole team wearing ridiculous clothing and it's just become mm. normal 
And then it becomes the old saying that we all love, we've always done it this way. <sighs> right? And that was never how we intended to do it in the first place. And because the <laughs> founder's too busy elsewhere, this normalization deviance kicks in. But this flow chart mapping of the process is what we want to do is we get everyone together who's in the same role. And we say to them, okay, step by step, what do we need to do? So what's our trigger? We're all familiar with triggers. We should be. We're mm -hmm. kind of listening to this podcast regularly, talking about like Zapier or IFTTT or these other things. We're talking about triggers. It's the same thing for a process. So what kicks it off? So it might be, for instance, let's assume um, an incoming support ticket. That's our trigger, right? Then what happens next? It's that does someone open the email? Someone opens and does something. So we have like actual action boxes. Something happens. We have decision yeah. trees where a decision yeah. is made. And the idea is you map these parts out. You don't need to go too deep and like map it out to its like intricate details, like a standard operating procedure, but you need to have all of these blocks in place and you need to have the output. What does that output get passed to? So does it get passed to another department? So that's another, what we call a swim lane. So imagine a pool with swimming lanes. It can get yeah. passed from department to department. So you can, once you've done all that and you've boxed it out with actions and decisions, and you can really just do it basically like that. And you've worked out what the trigger is and what the inputs are that are required and the end of it and what the outputs are required. For instance, it might be that we have to pass X spreadsheet out to another department as that's our output, right? Or we have to invoice a client. We can mm -hmm. then establish what exactly is required on the inputs, what exactly is required on the outputs. So we're not over delivering, we're not under delivering, and we're also not going back and forth at the start trying to ask for questions and more information that's a waste of everyone's time by just mapping like that you'll find madness involved you will find things yeah. we were saying sandra <laughs> what why are you why are you typing into the spreadsheet printing it off walking upstairs for david to then type into another spreadsheet why you will find all sorts of oddities like this in processes you never thought existed once yeah. you find those out you can then time box stuff so how long does it take we can all vote and we can we can do basically like a blind voting system. So in uh, software technology, there's a there's a like a methodology called Scrum, which many people are familiar with. And yeah. in Scrum, when we estimate tasks, we often do it with something called Scrum Poker. So we'll all have a little app on our phone, download for free, and have it minutes. And when we decide in a time box how long something takes, not just the action, but also a decision, we can all vote in minutes. Once we've time boxed everything, we also know how much everyone gets paid. Now we know how much one cycle costs us every time the business does it. Mm. And now we can start to say, cool, all right, now how many times have we run that a week or a day or a year? And what does it look over three years? And three years is the magic number because with that three year number, you can then say, hang on a minute, this is costing us $175,000 over three years. We could just probably automate that for 50,000 and we could just do something else instead and have to worry about that stuff or yeah. split it in half. That's the power of processes and, and flow charts. It, the simplicity is the absolute key. Yeah. Uh, it, it is really almost no more complicated than that. It's about making sure that we all agree. And the funniest thing is when you do these, if you ask, if we do workshops, this is how we normally interact with clients. So okay. Like, like mini ones or, or longer ones are in person. But the point of it is you'll be amazed at how many times if you ask three people who do the same job, to map a process, <laughs> it's almost completely different in every single example. It's, yep. it's amazing um, where people just were unaware. Yeah, and that's a that's actually a good segue. I, I saw that I saw that differentiation across the board, even in myself. At times, I would map differently, and one of the things that one of the first things I did in my my automation service provider program is create a framework. Now it holds me to the same steps. And then it even got to the point now, Daniel, where I've got certain shapes that always signify a certain thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's a method of what's vertical, what's horizontal. I just remember being so overwhelmed and, th and I'm an engineer, man, I'm an engineer. So this yeah. is overwhelmed after engineering of like, how do I get started with a flow chart? I, yeah. I want this beautiful output. I like the boxes and the arrows and then I would do it. And sometimes I'd just be like, Ugh, it looks so plain or bland. So there was a part of me that also knew 
it needed to be visually appealing in my opinion because when i refer back to this i don't want to have to think extremely hard so i started learning tactics different shapes different colors mean different things so i can look without seeing text Mm-hmm. Dan, like without seeing any text, yeah. I can look at one of my flow charts and based on the shapes and the colors, I can get an idea of what's going on. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's how that's how it should be. And I think a lot of people listen to stuff like this and then there's going to be a lot of people listening to this being like, I have no time to do all this, man. But that's the thing. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing it. Right. That's what you pay. That's, that's what you pay people for. Right. So yes. one of the things that we have, we have, a, we have a rule internally called documentation first. Mm. everyone hates me for you mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the we use um we use notion for our internal documentation okay wiki. There, there are loads of other things out there that you can use right for it yeah yeah notion's um, a good internal wiki tool though yeah it is right yeah. and it sits on everyone's desktop it's easily accessible but the rule yep. we have is documentation first so that means when you go to do a task you check the documentation and if it's not there guess what you're documenting it and you're doing the <laughs> flow chart and you're reporting it or if it's wrong you're the one editing it um, yeah, and, yes. and, if, and if you're caught not doing it, then, you know, someone's going to be on your tail about that. But it's a great way to kind of force everyone along the kind of same line. And it doesn't put all of the pressure on the founder, especially when you're kind of like yeah. sub or around $2 million to have to do all of the operational stuff. Right. It's not all yeah. on you. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a shared responsibility for that. And it's really important that everyone does it. Yeah, I, I just feel like um, it, it, this is so important because even like you're mentioning, you know, you sit down with a business owner, get them to you start mapping out their process and they're like, what? Why are we? Huh? That doesn't make sense because they get so used to doing the process. Right. How the process makes them feel. Maybe it's happy. Maybe it's overwhelmed. They get really intimate with the feeling and they're just totally blind to it. They've never seen it. They've never seen the process, so they don't even know what the possibilities are until you map it. Then you map it, and it's like, oh, my God, why are we not doing this? How about this? I used to do it for fun. Just like, hey, sit down. I I remember I gave a presentation, and at the end of it, I said, okay, I'm going to sit in front of my computer, shine it on the the, uh, screen here, or project it. I said shine. Put (laughs) Project it on the screen here and put people in the hot seat, and I was mapping out their process on the spot right yeah the entire room is like oh wait a minute why why are they going there like everybody daniel like if you don't have to be an expert you just have to be willing to embrace like uh uh, that's not right right like yeah right you just (laughs) have to be willing to fix it (laughs) yeah and i think a big thing as well is like as entrepreneurs and founders are so busy yeah some of the busiest people ever and um a lot of it is we end up uh, presuming. We presume that once we passed it over to someone, well, that's why they're always going to do it. Yep. And even when you hit 200 people, you're like, well, no, it's cool because originally I told the first person this is the way we do it, and it, it will it will come away from you. And that's and that's where it's really important to have this because it adds that layer of transparency, which is really really important. I'm a big believer in transparency in businesses, um, yeah. and I think automation can really work well with that, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. T- tell me about this. Um, you do process consulting and I, I, it was so refreshing. I can't I can't tell you how how refreshing it is just to go to your website and, and just read through how you're positioning yourself and the, the, the type of service that you offer. But when you when you say process consulting, it made me feel like there's a certain type of company that understands, you know what, we've got to get our processes together. Are are you finding that companies are coming to you, having that identified in some capacity that my process is something's not working. We're successful. We could be more successful. Or is it a sense of they come to you for one thing and it ends up turning out that they really need process uh, optimization? Yeah. So typically the types of businesses that we encounter, they come to us like, oh, we've got this problem. We're growing too quickly. Everything's out of control. There's like fires everywhere. I don't know. Like we just don't know what we're going to do. Like we need someone to help us sort this out. And that is normally the way that it starts. Um, Mm -hmm. Occasionally, you get someone coming to you, uh, and they've kind of got some blinkers on, and they haven't seen. They're like, I just want to automate this one thing. And you're like, okay, well, let's let's explore that one thing, and and then in in a mini workshop and see what kind of way that takes us. But 
for the majority of them, yeah, it is because their growth has gone stratospheric. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and what I hear from almost every single one of these companies, especially from the ones who've had previous businesses that haven't been as successful, they all tell me that having too much business and growing too fast is more stressful than not being able to find any business, which seems like wow. a crazy thing to say. Yeah. Right? But when you really care about your business, that things are starting to fall apart, and you know we're really starting to, like, excuse me, trying to piss people off, right? Mm -hmm. And like, losing customers and clients because we've got bad service because it's just out of control. It's a horrible feeling, right? Yeah. Wow. It's it's like the psychology is I'd rather worry about getting a client than losing one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I would right. I would almost guarantee. That the people you know you're helping people with like marketing and sales automation right yeah and we're taking a place where they're like oh, i'm just sending the emails one by one and then you go in like okay look guys <laughs> this <laughs> just stop right <laughs> but the the reality is once they hit that point and then they've automated this suddenly they turn around oh my god this is the best thing ever chris you're amazing yeah. you've saved yeah. my life you've changed like and i guarantee you here this you've changed my life yeah right your yep. automation and what you're doing well they haven't quite clocked yet is in six months time they're going to go oh my god onboarding of new clients has become horrific <laughs> right because yep. they're because now operations can't keep up there you go and this is then, then this is where well, then we we start to speak to people right um it's super yes. fun. super oh super man fun. i love it so in in the th there's definitely a blue ocean uh, effect to process consulting because again I feel like there's a lot process is subjective right there's a process to get your website built there's a pro it's everywhere everything yeah, we yeah. do is a process right but specifically to automation um, in scaling a company or or ensuring that a company's scale does not cannibalize itself right and that they can continue on that that trajectory process then becomes the required it, it becomes the foundation and mm -hmm. and i don't know about you daniel i, I want to give you the floor here but one of the things that i look for especially in a tech startup that's coming and saying hey chris we, we really want your help to help us scale xyz i'm actually happy when i see manual processes that are being exhausted the people in them are being exhausted yet they're producing a profit Mm -hmm. Because to your earlier point, being able to pro map out the process and then start to get a good idea of if we just did this one thing, this is what you would gain in either hours back, time mm -hmm. saved, you know, mm -hmm. um, it becomes a, to me, very valuable skill or resource to be able to go somewhere and have somebody consult specifically on your processes to help you scale after after a client comes and i know you do the workshop and there's a lot of exploration there walk away with a game plan start to map out the processes and they see it do you see that their mindset towards processes maintains that level of excitement or is it just kind of like oh that worked and then they just kind of forget about it yeah i mean uh <laughs> I suppose the analogy you could make is kind of like it's kind of like the business equivalent of crack if crack were a good thing <laughs> which is definitely not right let's just be i know you could see it i was pausing me like i shouldn't be <laughs> still i've said it hey, we're late. here we're it's here it. yeah just edit that out just edit that. um i'm joking uh so it, it is a bit like that yeah so what will generally happen is is that you know you, you'll run a whole workshop and at the end you'll say look here is the saving over three of these you would make if you automated this after your automation costs. Uh, yeah. And then people kind of go full steam into it. But once they've then exhausted all those angles, they become addicted to that growth and that, oh my God, now we can do all these other things we want to do. Oh, I think we could also automate this, we could do this thing, we could do this, and I then we will look yeah. carefully. But the, the important part here is to make sure that, you know, when you're consulting, you need to be really careful um, that the advice you give is good for the client, right? And not for you. So there is often as many times you're going to say no as you're going to say yes, because if it was a bad idea. It shouldn't be done. So if it's not going to produce an ROI, or if it's just going to look like something that's like unethical or just morally bankrupt, it shouldn't be done. 
right? Or just yeah. when you know it's just not going to work out long term, because whilst the numbers might stack, right? Oh, let's let's move all of our our call centers to um, like voice assistance AI. That's a terrible idea. Brilliant ROI, a terrible yeah. idea, because long term you'll just lose all your customers to someone else whose startup then says we have real people in support. Right, that right. like it's all about building moats in businesses, right? And that's what we're talking about here. Like for many companies, like their moat is support, right? Their moat is customer service. And yeah. sure, yeah, automate a lot of stuff, but you've got and and that can be a moat with automation. Uh, but you've got to be really careful, I think, with that type of stuff. Really careful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it leads to especially um, the average founder. What I found is the average founder gets that excitement, and they're just on to the next thing. They're they're not necessarily paying attention to the process that got them there. They're just more so wanting to say, hey, look, OK, we got this done. Next thing. Hey, this thing. Can we do it? And then it's you who reins them in and say, hey, remember how we got here? Yeah. yeah. Mapping processes, <laughs> being intentional. We're going to do that same thing. Yeah. To to go to the next or or, or, or hit the next objective. So. That does make sense. You know, it's short lived. The victory is short lived. But I, I I think, you know, when there's pain there, they don't forget when it's like, man, I remember when it took me 30 minutes, every client and five clients a day. And now it's only two minutes, you know, like it's a reminder yeah. um, of the value of it. And I find that it becomes like an internal salesperson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I say to my clients a lot, you know, they say to me, oh, yeah, I think I think we're done with process. I think we're good. I think we've automated everything. I'm like, cool. I was like, okay, so go on holiday for two weeks, turn your phone off. No laptop, no phone. How do you feel about that? And they're like, wow, I don't think we could do that. I'm like, well, yeah. listen, man, you are not there yet, right? Don't <laughs> don't start like resting and thinking it's all good because that's the reality. If, if yeah. most business owners just said, cool, right, I'm off to wherever Australia for two weeks and I'm not gonna have any phone or any laptop no email nothing and you come back there'd be like a, <laughs> a nuclear war in the business and you've got to make sure that's not going to happen because you know yeah, earlier on you were mentioning some people are quite happy just like working away and be like no no I'm good at this level I'm just going to keep doing like this I'm good at like one or two million and I'll just keep it just keep on churning and battling away you've got to take a holiday you've got to have a break like that's why isn't that why everyone starts a business because you're like I don't want to work for this guy anymore. I want to do, I want to decide when I work and I want to yep. be in charge and be able to yep. go do what I want, wherever I want. And you build this really horrible, imaginary, like invisible prison around yourself. Yep. You That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And, and the only way to escape that is systems. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. You start, start with the process, start with the steps that got you here. Let's, let's map it out. Let's get these processes clear and defined mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll we can we can automate it. But let's the foundation of the automation is going to be the process. So bad process, bad automation is, is just going to amplify what's there. So, Daniel, I can't thank you enough, man, for for coming on to the podcast and and talking through process mapping and consulting. I, I My hope is that listeners are starting to have a higher appreciation um, and by listeners, I mean the marketers, the consultants that are actually going to be the ones helping these businesses. Don't just gloss over process mapping. Don't just gloss over the process. It's extremely important. And then on the flip side, for the founders who are looking for the solution, listen, everything lies in the process, in, in the manner in which you get things done. <laughs> right there. There is no sign up for automation and it just starts working. It's going to run on the foundation of your processes. So I'm, I'm glad to have a, another voice on the podcast to echo those sentiments. If our listeners wanted to find out more about you or connect or your company, um, where's the best place that they can go? You can visit our website, which is lolly.co, or you can follow me, me on Twitter at I'm Daniel Cooper. Great, great. So we'll have those links in the show notes, Daniel, again, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. This was great. I enjoyed it. And I hope our listeners take more than two to three things away that they implement immediately, but more so have a stronger appreciation, value and understanding for processes, man. I hope so, man. Otherwise, it's just me and you versus the world and process. <laughs> <laughs> right.
<laughs> right. So get on board, everybody. Digital marketers and, and, and founders alike, get, get on this process train. It's all in the process. You have resources. They can never say, Daniel, they can never say that. They've got resources and, they, and they've got a means. So take advantage. Daniel, man, um, thank you again, man. And I'll see you online. Thanks, man. Take care. All right.